The Fate of Empires by Sir John Glubb. As we pass through life, we learn by experience. We look back on our behaviour when we were young and think how foolish we were. In the same way, our family, our community and our town endeavour to avoid the mistakes made by our predecessors. The experiences of the human race have been recorded in more or less detail for some 4,000 years. If we attempt to study such a period of time in as many countries as possible, we seem to discover the same patterns constantly repeated under widely differing conditions of climate, culture and religion. Surely, we ask ourselves, if we studied calmly and impartially the history of human institutions and development over these 4,000 years, should we not reach conclusions which would assist to solve our problems today? For everything that is occurring around us has happened again and again before. The only thing we learn from history, it has been said, is that men never learn from history. A sweeping generalisation, perhaps, but one which the chaos in the world today goes far to confirm. What, then, can be the reason why, in a society which claims to probe every problem, the bases of history are still so completely unknown? Several reasons for the futility of our historical studies may be suggested. First, our historical work is limited to short periods. The history of our own country, or that of some past age which, for some reason, we hold in respect. Second, even within these short periods, the slant we give to our narrative is governed by our own vanity rather than by objectivity. If we are considering the history of our own country, we write at length of the periods when our ancestors were prosperous and victorious, but we pass quickly over their shortcomings or their defeats. Our people are represented as patriotic heroes, their enemies as grasping imperialists or subversive rebels. In other words, our national histories are propaganda, not well-balanced investigations. Third, in the sphere of world history, we study certain short, usually unconnected periods, which fashion at certain epochs has made popular. Greece, 500 years before Christ, and the Roman Republic and early Roman Empire are cases in point. The intervals between the great periods are neglected. If we desire to ascertain the laws which govern the rise and fall of empires, the obvious course is to investigate the imperial experiments recorded in history and to endeavour to deduce from them any lessons which seem to be applicable to them all. The word empire by association with the British Empire, is visualised by some people as an organisation consisting of a home country in Europe and colonies in other continents. In this essay, the term empire is used to signify a great power, often called today a superpower. Most of the empires in history have been large land blocks, almost without overseas possessions. We possess a considerable amount of information on many empires recorded in history and of their vicissitudes and the lengths of their lives. For example, Assyria, 859-612 BC, 247 years. Persia, Cyrus and his descendants, 538-330 BC, 208 years. Greece, Alexander and his successors, 331-100 BC, 231 years. The Roman Republic, 260 to 27 BC, 233 years. The Roman Empire, 27 BC to AD 180, 207 years. The Arab Empire, AD 634 to 880, 246 years. The Mameluke Empire, AD 1250 to 1517, 267 years. The Ottoman Empire, 1320 to 1570. 250 years. Spain, 1500 to 1750, 250 years. Romanov Russia, 1682 to 1916, 234 years. Britain, 1700 to 1915, 250 years. What then, we may ask, can have been the factor which caused such an extraordinary similarity in the duration of empires under such diverse conditions and such utterly different technological achievements. One of the very few units of measurement which have not seriously changed since the Assyrians is the human generation, a period of about 25 years. Thus, a period of 250 years would represent about 10 generations of people. 
A closer examination of the characteristics of the rise and fall of great nations may emphasize the possible significance of the sequence of generations. Let us then attempt to examine the stages in the lives of such powerful nations. Stage 1. The Outburst Again and again in history we find a small nation, treated as insignificant by its contemporaries, suddenly emerging from its homeland and overrunning large areas of the world. These sudden outbursts are usually characterized by an extraordinary display of energy and courage. The new conquerors are normally poor, hardy and enterprising, and above all aggressive. The decaying empires which they overthrow are wealthy but defensive-minded. But the new nation is not only distinguished by victory in battle, but by unresting enterprise in every field. Men hack their way through jungles, climb mountains, or brave the Atlantic and the Pacific Oceans in tiny cockle shells. Fearless initiative characterizes such periods. Other peculiarities of the period of the conquering pioneers are their readiness to improve and experiment. Untrammeled by traditions, they will turn anything available to their purpose. If one method fails, they try something else. Uninhibited by textbooks or book learning, action is their solution to every problem. Poor, hardy, often half-starved and ill-clad, they abound in courage, energy and initiative, overcome every obstacle and always seem to be in control of the situation. So many examples can be given of the sudden eruption of an obscure race into a nation of conquerors that the truth of the phenomenon cannot be held to be doubtful. The first stage of the life of a great nation, therefore, after its outburst, is a period of amazing initiative and almost incredible enterprise, courage, and hardihood. These qualities, often in a very short time, produce a new and formidable nation. These early victories, however, are won chiefly by reckless bravery and daring initiative. The ancient civilization thus attacked will have defended itself by its sophisticated weapons and by its military organization and discipline. The barbarians quickly appreciate the advantages of these military methods and adopt them. As a result, the second stage of expansion of the new empire consists of more organized, disciplined, and professional campaigns. In other fields, the daring initiative of the original conquerors is maintained in geographical exploration, for example, pioneering new countries, penetrating new forests, climbing unexplored mountains, and sailing uncharted seas. The new nation is confident, optimistic, and perhaps contemptuous of the decadent races which it has subjugated. The methods employed tend to be practical and experimental, both in government and in warfare, for they are not tied by centuries of tradition, as happens in ancient empires. Moreover, the leaders are free to use their own improvisations, not having studied politics or tactics in schools or in textbooks. Commercial Expansion We saw that these new conquerors acquired the sophisticated weapons of the old empires, and adopted their regular systems of military organization and training. A great period of military expansion ensued, which we may call the Age of Conquests. The conquests resulted in the acquisition of vast territories under one government, thereby automatically giving rise to commercial prosperity. We may call this the Age of Commerce. The Age of Conquests, of course, overlaps the Age of Commerce. The proud military tradition still holds sway, and the great armies guard the frontiers, but gradually the desire to make money seems to gain hold of the public. During the military period, glory and honour were the principal objects of ambition. To the merchant, such ideas are but empty words which add nothing to the bank balance. The conquest of vast areas of land and their subjection to one government automatically acts as a stimulant to commerce. Both merchants and goods can be exchanged over considerable distances. Moreover, if the empire be an extensive one, it will include a great variety of climates, producing extremely varied products, which the different areas will wish to exchange with one another. The speed of modern methods of transportation tends to create in us the impression that far-flung commerce is a modern development, but this is not the case. Objects made in Ireland, Scandinavia, and China have been found in the graves of the ruins of the Middle East, dating from 1,000 years before Christ. The means of transport were slower, but, when a great empire was in control, commerce was freed from the innumerable shackles imposed upon it today by passports, import permits, customs, boycotts, and political interference. The wealth which seems, almost without effort, to pour into the country enables the commercial classes to grow immensely rich. How to spend all this money becomes a problem to the wealthy business community. 
art, architecture and luxury find rich patrons. Splendid municipal buildings and wide streets lend dignity and beauty to the wealthy areas of great cities. The rich merchants build themselves palaces, and money is invested in communications, highways, bridges, railways, or hotels, according to the varied patterns of the ages. The first half of the Age of Commerce appears to be peculiarly splendid. The ancient virtues of courage, patriotism, and devotion to duty are still in evidence. The nation is proud, united, and full of self-confidence. Boys are still required, first of all, to be manly, to ride, to shoot straight, and to tell the truth. It is remarkable what emphasis is placed, at this stage, on the manly virtue of truthfulness, for lying is cowardice, the fear of facing up to the situation. Boys' schools are intentionally rough. Frugal eating, hard living, breaking the ice to have a bath, and similar customs are aimed at producing a strong, hardy, and fearless breed of men. Duty is the word constantly drummed into the heads of young people, the age of commerce is also marked by great enterprise in the exploration for new forms of wealth. Daring initiative is shown in the search for profitable enterprises in far corners of the earth, perpetuating to some degree the adventurous courage of the age of conquests. The age of affluence. There does not appear to be any doubt that money is the agent which causes the decline of this strong, brave and self-confident people. The decline in courage, enterprise and a sense of duty is, however, gradual. The first direction in which wealth injures the nation is a moral one. Money replaces honour and adventure as the objective of the best young men. Moreover, men do not normally seek to make money for their country or their community, but for themselves. Gradually, and almost imperceptibly, the age of affluence silences the voice of duty. The object of the young and the ambitious is no longer fame, honour or service, but cash. Education undergoes the same gradual transformation. No longer do schools aim at producing brave patriots ready to serve their country. Parents and students alike seek the educational qualifications which will command the highest salaries. The Arab moralist Ghazali complains in these very same words of the lowering of objectives in the declining Arab world of his time. Students, he says, no longer attend college to acquire learning and virtue, but to obtain those qualifications which will enable them to grow rich. The same situation is everywhere evident amongst us in the West today. Another outward change which invariably marks a transition from the age of conquests to the age of affluence is the spread of defensiveness. The nation, immensely rich, is no longer interested in glory or duty, but is only anxious to retain its wealth and its luxury. It is a period of defensiveness, from the Great Wall of China, to Hadrian's Wall on the Scottish border, to the Maginot Line in France in 1939. Money being in better supply than courage, subsidies instead of weapons are employed to buy off enemies. To justify this departure from ancient tradition, the human mind easily devises its own justification. Military readiness, or aggressiveness, is denounced as primitive and immoral. Civilized peoples are too proud to fight. The conquest of one nation by another is declared to be immoral. Empires are wicked. This intellectual device enables us to suppress our feelings of inferiority when we read of the heroism of our ancestors and then ruefully contemplate our position today. It is not that we are afraid to fight, we say, but we should consider it immoral. The weakness of pacifism is that there are still many peoples in the world who are aggressive. Nations who proclaim themselves unwilling to fight are liable to be conquered by peoples in the stage of militarism, perhaps even to see themselves incorporated into some new empire with the status of mere provinces or colonies. When to be prepared to use force and when to give way is a perpetual human problem which can only be solved, as best we can, in each successive situation as it arises. In fact, however, History seems to indicate that great nations do not normally disarm from motives of conscience, but owing to the weakness of a sense of duty in the citizens, and the increase in selfishness and the desire for wealth and ease. The Age of 